Obviously, Speaker of the Hour is Rick, Brother Rick Popejoy, and uh, Brother Rick has been married to Miss Mona for 42 years. Together, they have four children and eight grandchildren. Rick graduated from the Brown Trail School of Preaching in 1984 and has been preaching for 40 years in Texas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, and currently preaches for the Church of Christ in Nesbitt, Mississippi. I'd like to invite you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, as we will be discussing in this uh, wonderful series of lessons on conversion, we will be discussing the conversion of the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16. While you're turning or opening up your Bible there, I do want to, uh, although I did not get to partake of the riches of uh, the lunch hour, uh, this, to, uh, to this day I did and I have in the past and I will in the future. So I want to thank the ladies for the uh, wonderful and hard work that they do. I have never uh, come to a meal here to where I said, nah, I don't think I want any of that stuff. Never. It has always been wonderful, and I appreciate the labor, the hard work, the planning that goes into that. But also, I would be amiss if I did not extend uh, my gratitude to the elders, to uh, uh, the, the work that they do in regards to the development of this series of lessons. Uh, uh, having to do that at least once a year, I know that that is not an easy job, especially it's easy to do it for one year. <laughs> But when you do it for 41 years, it's not easy. And uh, so uh, I appreciate the work that they do. And uh, I'm always grateful that they uh, uh, choose uh, to, uh, uh, they have at least for a couple of years uh, invited me to be with you. There's a lot, if I'm going to teach homiletics, there's a lot that I need to learn about homiletics. And so uh, I get to uh, sit at the feet of these good men and I appreciate so much the work that you do as well. The congregation here is to be commended uh, with regards to the work that they do uh, in regards to the lectureship as well. What must I do to be saved is the heart of where we are going to eventually get to in this lesson. That is the question that is asked by the Philippian Jailer, what must I do to be saved? And you remember that Paul and Silas, it says, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and all thy house. Now there are a couple of things that I want to make clear that we will not do in this lesson only because of time constraints. Uh, and that's not a complaint, it's just an actuality. It's a reality that preachers uh, uh, live by. And so there are some things that I will not do today. Number one, I will not deal with the aspect of the household of the jailer being converted, meaning that that is uh, babies being baptized or converted. That is an obvious false doctrine uh, based upon many things that have been already spoken. We will not deal with that. But uh, number two, we will not deal with the aspect that just because the statement is made, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house, that is not instruction given to the Philippian jailer that if he believes that he will eventually convert his house. That is not what is being said in this text. And, uh, but we're not going to have the time and opportunity to be able to address those two issues in regards to that. To me, uh, when you read this text and you read your Bible, that is so obviously false that it almost seems a shame that we would even deal with it. And so uh, uh, I'm going to choose not to deal with it during this particular lesson. So, with that in mind, there are many things that we want to be able to deal with, and I always feel it is important 
in a lesson such as this to be able to take note of the historical setting that it is found in. Thus, the song that we just sang, uh, the second stanza, talks about the great Macedonian call. But I want to back up just a little bit and to take us as briefly as I know how through some of the things that are necessary, I believe, for a historical setting. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1, we find that Luke has a thesis. And he tells us the thesis of his prior document, which is the Gospel of Luke, which was, as he says in chapter 1, uh, O Theophilus, this former treatise, he says, I have made of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now I'm going to suggest that if you read and study the book of Acts, you will find that his thesis has not changed, but a smidgen. All right. Now his thesis in the book of Acts is uh, concerning the beginning and of all that the apostles and all that the church began both to do and to teach. That is the thesis of this particular uh, uh, document. Not only that, I want to I want to look at it from a couple of different vantage points, just real quick, just briefly. Uh, 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 Notice here in verse number 8 of chapter 1 that you have a pretty good outline. You have an outline that deals with the geography of the gospel as it is going forth. It is a good outline for the book. That it began in Jerusalem, that it went into all Judea, then it would go into Samaria, and then it would go into the uttermost parts of the earth. Just a side note here, our text is the uttermost parts of the earth. We're moving, or we have moved, from uh, uh, Asia uh, and Asia Minor. We're now moving into the European continent. And so the gospel, when it goes to Philippi, is going into the European continent at that particular time. And so I want you to notice here that uh, it's going to begin in Jerusalem. It's going to begin with power. It's going to begin with that promise of the Holy Spirit. And you come to Acts 2, beginning in verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, drop down to verse number 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse number 11 talks about what kind of utterance that was. Every man heard them speak in their own language, their own tongues, the wonderful works of God. Now, if you drop down to verse number 40, then it says, And with many other words uh, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation, this wicked generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse number 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now some of these things that I'm glossing over, trying to get uh, us a historical setting, is important to the event that we will eventually come to. And so I want you to keep these items in mind. But I want you to turn with me now to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we'll notice here uh, in uh, verses 4 and 5, verse number 1, we have Saul now that is brought upon the scene. And it says in verse number 4, <clears throat> excuse me, therefore they were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down into the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. I want you to notice back at the outline. Going from Jerusalem to Ju all of Judea, and then it was going to go into Samaria. Now the gospel or the outline of this book gets us to Samaria. And uh, there it says that verse number 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9. 
In Acts chapter 9, uh, Paul is on his way, uh, you remember, to Damascus, and he meets Jesus, and uh, he asks a similar question. As they ask in Acts chapter 2, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Paul also asked that question, or Saul, in verse number 6. What will thou have me to do? Now his instruction was to go into Damascus, and there it will be told thee what to do. Now we find, as we travel down to verse number 18, that as he was told what to do, the Bible says immediately, there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. Then you drop down to verse number 31. In verse number 31, there the Bible says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Now I want you to pay attention to this because the importance of the persecutor, Saul of Tarsus, is given to us in this one verse. When he was converted to the Lord, the church had rest. <laughs> That's how bad his havoc was in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 3. But now I want you to drop down with me uh, to chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Now here in chapter 10 and 11, the Gentiles are converted. This is the record of that. Chapter 11, uh, or cha chapter 11 is the chronological order that's going to be given to the events as they are told in chapter 10. But notice chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Again, important statement for chapter 16. Then Peter opened up his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And then if you drop down then uh, uh, to verse number uh, 20, it say, or excuse me, chapter 11, let's go to chapter 11 and uh, verse number 18, it says, And when they heard these things, that they held their peace and glorified God. That is, when the events were recorded for the Jews, it says now they understood the scheme of redemption as it pertained unto the Gentiles. So it says they held their peace, they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. There's an interesting statement that is now made in chapter uh, 11 in verse number 19. That there were some that had gone out based upon Acts chapter 8 at the scattering of uh, the stoning of Stephen. And they'd gone out as far as uh, Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. But notice this. They are preaching the word to none but the Jews only. You will not find that phrase here on in the book of Acts. What Acts chapter 10 and 11 demonstrate is that every nation, just like Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 uh, commissioned them to do, just like Mark chapter 16 verses 15 and 16 go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, they were to go to every nation, every ethnic group in Math, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 20, uh, 28 and verse number 18. And 19. And so that's what is being fulfilled at this particular moment and time. Now, notice also that it, uh, they began to preach unto the Gentiles. That's found in verse number 20. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch... By the way, here's another outline uh, uh, method of the book of Acts if you want to look at it and study it from this method there are two great preaching figures in the book of Acts Peter and Paul Peter takes up basically the first 12 chapters and Paul takes up the rest or you can look at it and study it from the vantage point of the two great congregations that are listed in this book 
that is the church at Jerusalem, 1 through uh, chapter 11 and verse number uh, 18, and then the church in Antioch. The church in uh, Jerusalem is going to hear about the great conversions that are taking place in Antioch, and so they're going to send a man by the name of Barnabas, whom they've given that name because he is such a great encourager. And he's going to build up the church to such an extent that he's going to need assistance. And he's going to seek after Saul. So it says in verse number 25 of chapter 11, Then Paul or then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And they're going to stay there uh, for some time. And the church is going to continue to grow under the work of Barnabas and uh, Saul. Now, chapter 12 then, I just want us to focus on verse number 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. You're going to find that phrase often in the book of Acts. That as it is being preached, and people are believing, and people are obeying, then much uh, individuals are going to be added to the Lord's church. Thus this phrase is not referencing the fact that a new scripture is added to the uh, a Bible, but it's referencing the effect of the Word of God in the hearts uh, and minds of men. Chapter 13 now. We have Antioch, right? We have uh, Saul and Barnabas uh, that are there. They are two. They're the first and the last of the prophets that are mentioned there uh, in the church at Antioch. But I want you to notice verse number 2. They ministered unto the Lord. They fasted. And the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And it says, When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and sent them away. What did they do? What was this mission that the Holy Spirit separated them for? Look at verse number 5. And they, when they went to uh, uh, Salome, uh, Salamis, they preached the Word of God. By the way, you're going to find that phrase consistently throughout the book of Acts as well. But I want you to notice here, now we have the very first missionary journey, right? The first of the great evangelistic tours that are going to take place. So turn with me here uh, to chapter 14 and verse number 23. Chapter 14, we come, we're come. we coming down to the end of that first journey. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Verse number 27. And they, uh, it says, when they were come and gathered the church together, they rehearsed all things that God had done with them and how that He had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Now, in chapter, at the latter part of chapter 15, there's a conflict that occurs between Saul and Barnabas, and so they're going to go their separate ways. But I want you to notice verse number, uh, verse number uh, uh, 40. It says, and Paul chose... Silas. Silas is now going to take Barnabas's place. They're going to go to Derby and Lystra, chapter 16 and verse number 1, and they're going to pick up Timothy. And then you get down to verse number 6. And when they had gone through uh, Pergia and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach uh, the word in Asia. And they were come to Messiah. Uh, and uh, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit forbade, uh, the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas. This is where our song comes into play. Now, tonight, this night, that is, Paul is going to receive a vision of a man over in Macedonia saying, Come and help us. Come and bring the gospel to us. And then you're going to start seeing these we's instead of they. Uh, which suggests then now that Luke has joined on with the Apostle Paul there. And uh, the first city that they come to uh, is uh, the city of Philippi, or they pass through some areas and they come to Philippi in verse number 12. Uh, Lydia is converted and her household, but I want you to notice beginning in verse number 16 now. Now we're narrowing this historical 
uh, setting down to the immediate context of the Philippian jailer. And we're going to find that there is a damsel within this city that is going to grieve Paul. Now, it takes a few days before Paul becomes grieved. She is uh, following them, and uh, it says, though, in verse number 16, that a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, now notice this, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And uh, so Paul, in uh, verse number 18, after she had done this for several days of going by and aligning herself with the apostolic doctrine or the apostolic message, it says, Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. I also want us to notice that when Paul uh, was grieved, he became the troubler of Philippi. Much like Elijah was the troubler of Israel uh, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. No, he says, I am not the troubler of Israel, but you and your house have troubled Israel. Uh, but I want you to notice here that when you trouble the area that you are in, when you begin to stir things up with those outside of the body of Christ, there are individuals that are going to lie about you, they're going to make up things, and they're going to try to stop you from doing what you have set out by the gospel to do. And so I want you to notice here in verse number 19. It says that when her master saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. And they brought them unto the magistrates, saying, Here is the legal indictment against Paul and Silas. These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Where did they trouble the city? There, there is no record of them troubling the city. They didn't trouble the city at all as far as we know. And it says, the second part of that is they teach customs that are not lawful uh, for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. In what way did Paul ever teach customs and uh, uh, laws that were contrary to Roman law? There was none at this time. He is not teaching uh, things that are contrary. It's the same thing that the Jews sought to do before Pilate with Jesus. If you're, a friend of, if you're a friend of Caesar, then you'll put Jesus to death because he claims to be a king. Even Pilate understood that Jesus was not claiming to be the kind of king that would get him crucified. But he knew it was for envy's sake. But I do want you to notice something here. Maybe we should pay attention to this. Be wary of multitudes. Be wary of crowds. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be in crowds in order to teach them, but here's what I want you to be wary of. Crowds do not have a mind of their own. Crowds are swayed by quick persuasion to do some of the dumbest things that they would not, if they had time by themselves, just to stop and think about it, they would never engage in. So all of these accusations are being made, and it says uh, that the multitude rose together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded them uh, commanded to beat them, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging, here's our character for this story, the jailer. Now the jailer comes upon the scene, and he is given a charge to keep them safely. The best way to keep them safely is to put them into the inner dungeon, because in the inner dungeon, you're going to have uh, multiple uh, 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 walls to get out, but not only that, you're going to be fastened with stocks. All of the prisoners in uh, the inner 
uh, prison are going to be made fast with stocks. And so it says then that Paul and Silas now become worshipers. Here they are in the inner sanctum, we might say, of the prison. And it says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners, this is interesting to me, it doesn't say the jailer. I'm not saying that the jailer did not hear anything, but it says the prisoners heard them. There's going to come a time here in just a minute, in a few verses, where the jailer is going to admit somehow he has knowledge of the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's an earthquake that occurs. And when that earthquake occurs, he as a good Roman jailer or even a good Roman soldier, if prisoners escape, rather than having a public execution and the humiliation that would be associated with that, he takes out his sword in order to kill himself. And so the Apostle Paul speaks up and he says, Do thyself no harm. So he prevents then the jailer, he intervenes on behalf of the jailer, and he says, we are all here. Not a single, not, not just we, Paul and Silas, are not here, but not a single prisoner has escaped, even though the great earthquake that occurred unloosed, or unfastened all of the stocks. All had the ability to flee, but they did not flee. And so he calls for a light. By the way, it doesn't mean that there's no light, that it's completely dark in there. This is a light of examination. Uh, there would be dim lights uh, uh, in there, but there is an examination that he wants to do. Now he has to examine, are all the prisoners here? Are they still in there? Uh, are they still in, is, or is everything okay? Well, they are all there upon examination. And so the Bible says he fell down before Paul and Silas, not for worship, but just gratitude. And he brought, notice this, he brought them out. They've been in the inner jail. Now they're going out of the inner jail and he's going to ask them this question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Upon which Paul says, or they, Paul and Silas say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou and thy house, or thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now I want us to pause here just for a second to make note of a couple of items here because there are uh, many individuals who when they read over this with their denominational uh, rose-colored glasses, they, they immediately say, see, this jailer was saved before baptism. By the way, that's not what it says. I want you to read very carefully with me what it says. He asked the question, what must I do to be saved? He did not ask the question, what must I believe to be saved? So either Paul, hard of hearing, did not understand what the jailer said and gave him instruction on a question that he did not ask, or Paul is telling him, what he must do in order to be saved. Not what he must believe. The word belief oftentimes is misunderstood because uh, in the denominational realm we are told that belief is some kind of assent. It's some kind of mental assent uh, in regards to, I just accept the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, in my mind, and I am saved. That is not what he asked, and that is not what Paul told him to do. Paul told him a action word. Believe. Believe cannot be separated 
unless it is a false belief from obedience. It cannot. There's not a single time in the book of Acts where they are told or it is said that someone believed uh, on uh, believe the gospel where it does not show that they immediately obeyed the gospel. It's inseparable. But now let's just notice this in another text. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we refer to that, right, as the great hall of faith. <laughs> Here are individuals who believed God... But I want you to notice something. In fact, before we get there, hold your finger there. Because I want us to go to Romans 4 and notice verse number 10 before we do this. Romans 4 and verse number 10. Have you ever noticed here when it's talking about the same... By the way, Romans 4, Hebrews 11, and James 2 are going to use the same illustration out of the Old Testament, the same historical context, and they're going to say the exact same thing. I want you to pay attention to this. It says here, verse number 3, it says uh, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But verse number 10 has a question. How? How then was it reckoned? Romans chapter 4 is dealing with the how of the reckoning. How was it reckoned? It was reckoned by faith. But now we have another question in James chapter 2. So in James chapter 2, notice with me. Uh, let's just go ahead and turn over. Keep your finger on Hebrews 11. We're getting back there. Uh, James chapter 2. Notice, uh, let's use the uh, verse number 20. This is the same context. Or verse number, excuse me, verse number 21. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Notice the next word. When. When. Not how, but when. When he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Verse 24. We see then uh, how that by works a man is justified and not by, notice this, faith only. Mental assent. Faith that has absolutely no works attached to it cannot, will not, ever save anyone. Period. That's James' whole point. And so he says in verse number 26, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? When? When faith, when our belief begins and engages activity of obedience to God is when we can say that I have Faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and not until. Outside of that, it's just a weak faith. Outside of that, it's just a faith only that cannot save. But now let's go back and notice this in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 8. By faith. How? By faith. How? By faith. When? When he was called to go into another place, that he should go after, receive for an inheritance. What? Obey. When did his faith engage so that it could be understood that it was reckoned unto him as righteousness when it obeyed God? And he went out, not knowing from where he went. Every single uh, item in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is going to say the exact same thing. Thing. How? By faith. Faith cometh by, the, uh, by, the, by he hearing the word of God, Romans 10 and 17. So there was instruction from God, and when a person obeys the instruction, then I know that they have believed. Now you might say, well, I don't understand how that's got to do with the Philippian jailer. You didn't, go, you didn't say anything about that. No, we hadn't got there yet. I want you to notice with me that it says, we're going to pick up the uh, text here in verse number 32. He asked the question, uh, uh, and they told him the answer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But what do they mean by believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. There's more instruction that is going to be given to this individual. By the way, to our knowledge... 
knows absolute or very little about the eternal plan of salvation. So I wonder if this is what Paul did before he got to Thessalonica. When he's there before uh, the synagogue, it says he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. I I wonder if this is what Jesus did in Luke chapter 24. Notice with me to these uh, two men on the road to Emmaus, verse number 25. It says, uh, well, let's look at verse number 26. It says, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, He expounded unto them all the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. I wonder if it's the same thing that you find in verse number 44 with His disciples. And He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. He then opened up their understanding that they might understand the Scripture. Further teaching is going on right here in this context in Acts chapter 16. But I want you to notice here. It says then in verse number 33, after that instruction, he demonstrates signs of repentance. He then takes at the same hour of the night and washed their and was baptized he and all his straightway. But I want you to pay attention to verse number 34. Verse number 34 is the, really the key. It says, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, what? Believing in God with all of his house. In verse number 31, he is told what to do to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 32 and 33 tells us how he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse number 34 then tells us that with all his house he believed. How do I know he believed? You remember the Ethiopian eunuch. Wherein uh, he says, Here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip answered, and he said, If thou believest. Well, how was Philip to know without a divine revelation that this man believed, except, as the text says, he opened up his mouth and made a confession. Based upon that confession, he took him into the water and he baptized him. But here's what we have with relationship uh, to the uh, Philippian jailer. We have obedience and belief tied so closely together that you cannot separate them. And for true belief to take place, that's the way it always is in the Bible. And, And we realize that today. If, if I ask my children, they're grown now, but uh, while they were being raised, if I asked them to do something and they did not do it, I might respond by saying, did you not hear me? To which they might respond, yes, I heard you. And then I might offer a threat if they do not engage in that behavior. Boy, if you don't get up out of that chair and get that trash out, I'll whoop your bottom all the way out to the trash can. I might offer something such as that. To which, if he's still sitting there, I'm already undoing my belt, and they're hearing that, you know, I'm already taking that out. But I say to him, do you not believe me? Well, he said he believed me. He said he heard my words, but he's not acting upon what he says he mentally has assented unto. Mental assent is not Bible belief. And so those who would say uh, uh, in verse number uh, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ thou and thy house shall be saved. By the way, that is as true of a statement as any other statement in the Bible. You believe like you're supposed to believe and you will be saved. Thus John chapter 3 and verse number 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
That is not a text that authorizes just mentally saying to yourself, yeah, I, I get it. That's, that, that's not it. That text as well as this one. And the context has demonstrated. The entire context that we went through. Read every... We're talking about every conversion. I wonder why we're doing this. Wouldn't one conversion account be enough? Come on, Jack. We've got to go through all of these? Well, Jack might say, or uh, uh, the other elders might say, right? Well, they're right here in the book. Why did Luke, by inspiration, feel the necessity to lay them all out just like this? So that man would be without excuse. And so, there's a lot that we could say in regards what it means to be saved and that's what this man wanted to do but I will just simply say this this is a text that has been abused and it has been misused by those in the denominational world who simply do not want to obey God it's really not I, I don't think it's about baptism I think it's about works they do not want to have to obey God in any form in order to be saved. Period. And this text does not teach that. Thank you.